On today's episode, we'll be telling the story of a little old lady serial killer who wreaked havoc in Sacramento, California in the 1980s. That story and more today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Yeah, you got me today. Uh, this will be a one and only type thing every now and then, but by popular request, you got me today. And here we are with uh, my good buddy, Andy. Hey, what's up? I'm Andy. Yep, that's Andy. <laughs> <laughs> a little uh, flip of rolls here today. Yeah, we're flipping the script here. Mike's going to take the helm. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. So uh, somebody made a comment, and we've been talking about it, so... Here I am. Yeah, we were talking about it anyway. Yeah, we were talking doing. about doing it anyway, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of nice, I have to say, to uh, kind of sit back and... Yeah, just kind of ride. Go with the flow. Yeah, go yeah. with the flow. And yeah. I don't know, I know this story a little bit. It's it's different. It's, it's a different one, but I, I don't know the details, and I purposely, I did not look into the details because I, I want my reactions to be... Yeah, genuine. So and it's funny when I saw, like, when I was looking this up and I found the old lady here. You know, I thought I, was, I thought I found Bug the what's the old lady on Bugs Bunny? Oh the, yeah, like the, the grandma, Tweety, Tweety, yeah, Tweety's mom or something. Yeah, yeah. the one that owns yeah. Tweety and yeah. and Sylvester, right? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, nice little old lady. Well, she's not so nice. <laughs> no, do you, yeah. you want to show? I've got a picture. Yeah, sure. Of her let's, ready. Yeah, let's, let's take her. Take a look at her here. Yeah, that's probably not a good picture. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, but she looks like. I mean, she looks like a sweet little old lady. Yeah, it looks like your grandma. I mean, right. you know, some of you'd be, you know. Well, why don't you come over and have some tea with me, honey? Yeah, yeah. Well, people do. People do. <laughs> and it's a bad mistake that yeah. they do, I'm well, assuming? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> kind of a bad mistake. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, well, hey, we'll dive right into this. Hey, dive right in, Mike. Want to get it done, did now? Let's get it done, did now. Okay. All right, here we go. By the way, her name is Dorothea, Helen Gray in the day, but... Was married and became a puente. She okay, was, yeah, she was born back in January 9th of nineteen twenty nine. Remember that year, great in the Redlands of California. It's a nice area. The Redlands, yeah. What is that? Redlands, that's a city. Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm thinking like a national park or something. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Anyway, all right. Sorry for those of you that are from the Redlands. If you see that, my uh, bad. Okay, but she was born to Trudy Ray or what is it, Trudy? Trudy May Nay Yates and Jesse James Gray. Jesse James. Jesse James. Yeah, big name back in that day, I'm sure. Ah, uh, yes. Because <laughs> he was really considered a hero. Yeah, I More can see that. People thought he was a hero than a bad guy. Yeah. All right. So her parents were both alcoholics. Shocker. Yep. And her father repeatedly threatened to kill himself in front of his children. Here we go. Sounds like a great dad. Yep. This, this is where it all starts. Uh, kind of go started out in the, you know, he's in the alcoholic thing. And they're both alcoholics, not just one. Yep, we so get, see that got, theme a lot. Yeah. So you get two. So her father died of tuberculosis in 1937, and her mother, who worked as a sex worker, you can't make this shit up. Can I just say I love? I love how seriously you're reading this. Yeah, <laughs> it is funny. Like it's crazy. Yeah. With these these people's lives. Yeah, it just yeah, it just you can't make this. Shit up. Okay, so both mom and dad are alcoholics, yep. and mom's a sex worker on top of it. On top of that, yeah. And dad threatenly, threatens to kill himself. But then he does die of tuberculosis. Okay, so, so dad's dead. Dad's mom's gone. Mom's still around, working the road, streets, whatever. <laughs> lot lizard. Yeah, lot lizard, whatever they do back in that day. And then, so as a sex worker, she lost custody of her children in 1938. So a year after he died, she loses her kids. Shocker. Yeah. So, and then she went on and she died in a motorcycle accident by the end of that year. Jesus. Yeah, a lot of death early in the in the life there. Good Lord. Okay. Yeah. So Fuente and her siblings were subsequently sent to an orphanage where she was sexually abused. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, dude, it's alcoholics, sex worker, 
And now she's getting, you know, she has this on it. Both yeah. parents dead. It's it's like the class we see it time and time again. Yep. It's like the classic setup for yep. and her life's just gonna be continually going downhill. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Jesus. So Gray's first marriage at six at the age of sixteen in nineteen forty five. Damn sixteen? Right after the war. Yep. See? Okay. Yep. Uh, she married a soldier by the name of Fred McFall. McFall. McFall? Yeah, I guess that's how you say it. Are there does she push somebody down the stairs? No, it's F A U L. Mm. Yeah. Mm. McFall. Value? I, I don't know how you say it. If you're from this family <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you know the name, let's let us know if you just said that or whatever. Leave a comment. Yeah, leave a comment if I said it wrong, <laughs> kind of spell it out or whatever. So he had just so he had just returned from the Pacific Theater of World War II. Okay. Yep. He's ready for uh get settled down. And they had two daughters between 1946 and 1948. Okay. Okay. Grace sent one child to live with relatives in Sacramento and placed the other up for adoption. So she didn't want either kid? Basically, it sounds like it. So one went to a family member, the other one she just adopted out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then her third child, it was a miscarriage. So she suffered a miscarriage. And then McFall, he left her in 1948. (laughs) Jeez. Right after they had the second child. Okay. So, yeah. I don't know when she would have had the miscarriage. Maybe before the second one? No, oh, maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, so she's already been through, she's been through some crap is what we're saying. Yeah. And I mean, she's what? Probably, you know, she's 16, 17 to 18, 18 years old now. Oh, yeah. At this point, And yeah. So not fully matured, but having to go through all of this drama yeah. already in life. And been married already. Right. Before she had her. And two kids and a miscarriage Mm -hmm. and no parents around and all the tragic history. Yep. It just keeps stacking up. Yep. And that's why she is what's going to be an interesting story. Okay. Let's see where this goes. We're going. Let's keep going. So the spring of 48, Gray was arrested for purchasing women's accessories using forged checks in Riverside. Okay. So here we go. We're going to start writing bad, you know, we're going to forge checks. Well, we always start with minor crimes and work our ways way up. Got to work way up. So she pled guilty to two counts of forgery, serving four months in jail and three years probation. Okay. Yeah. And then six months after her release, she left Riverside. Got out of town. Got out of town. Okay. I guess you could do that. Well, she's on probation, I guess. Did she have to get probate? I don't know. I don't know how they did stuff back then. I don't know. All right. So here we go again. We're going to make this. This is going to keep it interesting. Okay. Yep. So 1952, she married a merchant seaman. Uh, was it Richard Speck? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Was it Richard Speck? Okay. No, no, no. They'd make it sound so far like they'd make the perfect couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally different side, different coast. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We're gotcha. still in California. So. Gotcha. So Alex Bryn jo- Johansson, she married him in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, she created a fake persona calling herself Tia Singola Nayarda. N e y a a r d a. Is she like going for a singing career? Why does she have a persona? Well, she's she's a a Muslim woman of Egyptian and Israeli descent. Israeli oh, descent. So, okay. Yeah, she's changing over. She's gonna be somebody different. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, they had a tur- turbulent marriage. Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> uh, Gray took advantage of Johansson's frequent trips to sea by inviting men to their home and gambling away his money. Oh, uh, so she's one of those. Yeah. When he goes away to work, she she plays. She has her playtime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Gray was arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a bookkeeping firm as a front for a brothel in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least she's being smart about it. Yeah, like she's yeah, trying, she's to, trying cover. to cover it up. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, she was found guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. You know, you, say, you don't give you nothing for these things back in that day. Yeah, that sounds like nothing to me. Like a slap on the wrist, basically. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. It's just, that's why he probably encouraged her to keep going. Right. Yeah. All right. So in 1961, Johansson and Gray briefly committed to DeWitt State Hospital after a binge of drinking, lying, criminal behavior, and suicide attempts. While there, doctors diagnosed her as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. So probably did polar, uh, what is this? She probably got a... Uh, Not like bipolar, bipolar or, or some, something. Some issue going on, God. maybe. So she's already diagnosed yeah. as having some kind of psychosis. Mm-hmm. 
Ooh. And she just looks, she looks so sweet. Yeah, yeah, she does. I mean, <laughs> hello, Grandma. I'm expecting her to bring us cookies. Yeah, she probably does. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, she's already done the brothel thing. I mean, she was a bookkeeper. She's done the brothel. Yeah. I don't know. Moving now, on. Now she's a pathological liar. Okay. I didn't, never really know anybody to be a patho, been actually committed to be a pathological liar. I mean, I know people that lie, but... Oh, I was going to say, I think you and I both know some pathological liars. Well, we liars, do, but not but... diagnosed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Well, whatever. Okay, so Gray and Johansson divorced in 66. No shocker. Okay. Mirrors didn't make it. And although she continued to use Johansson's name for some time following their separation, Gray assumed the identity of Sharon Johansson hiding her delinquent behavior by portraying herself as a devout Christian woman. Okay. So this is persona number three now, right? Yeah. Different name. Different name. Yep. Different. Now she's a Christian woman. Yes. Devout. Devout Christian. Okay. There's different hierarchies. Oh, what are the hierarchies? I know, devout, okay. devout sounds pretty serious. Devout's the high end? Yeah. Sounds okay. like it, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It could be. So, yeah. Um, where do we go from there? So she... Uh, Established her re, uh, reputation as a caregiver, providing young women with a sanctuary from poverty and abuse without charge. So she became a devout Christian and started bringing in girls and took care of them. Okay. Uh, girls that needed help. Yeah. Well, like homeless or yeah. troubled. Unstable personalities. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So she's doing a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the moment. <laughs> Something tells me. Something tells me it's not going to be that way, but yeah. So, okay. you know, for the moment, she's she's providing a service for women that have issues, which is good. I mean, you know, you look at it right now, you'd think that's what she does. She brings, she takes care of people. Oh, yeah. Especially, I could see her pitching this idea. Oh, yeah. And I, I would buy into it, this little old lady. Oh, I run yeah. this thing. Or, yeah. yeah. I, get, I, I totally get that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on. So... And uh, so anyway, I don't know what to do with this one. <laughs> uh oh. No, no. So following her divorce, Fuente focused on running a boarding house located near 15th and F Streets in Sacramento. Oh, okay. Is this? That's the house. This is the house here. Yep. Okay. Got a big sprawling front yard. That's California. Yeah, that's that's a big yard. That's a huge yard for yeah California. Yeah, it's some real estate there. Yeah. It's a nice looking house though. Yeah, it's cute. Yep. Okay. Okay. She established herself as a genuine resource to the community to aid alcoholics, homeless people, and mentally ill people by holding Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and assisting individuals to sign up to receive Social Security benefits. Okay. I think I see where this is going. I love that you're laughing at this. I see. I think I know where this is going. It, 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 oh God, dude! But I, it sounds so admirable. Like yeah, it's, it does. Like she's genuinely doing something good. Yeah. But she's not. Okay. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is all cover for something. Yeah, it's got to be. <sighs> it's got to be. Oh man, just crazy. Oh, okay. So she changed her. Oh, here we go. She changed her public image to that of a respectable older matron by putting on vintage clothing, wearing large granny glasses. And letting her hair turn gray. Okay, so this is persona number four now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So she also established herself as a respected member of Sacramento's Hispanic community, funding charities, scholarships, radio programs, even. Yeah. And she eventually met and married Pedro Angel Montalvo, though Montalvo abruptly left the relationship a week after their marriage. A week? <laughs> Abruptly left the relationship after a week? I mean, well, the marriage, pretty much. That's she all left it all. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, okay. wonder what he saw. Uh, mm. The real her, apparently. I guess. So on December 21st, 1978, Dorothea Puente, now, was convicted of illegally cashing 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants. Oh, are these like the Social Security checks? Yes. Okay, so she's cashing their stuff. Checks, yeah. Okay. So she's helping these people out by taking in their, getting them set up for Social Security, <laughs> and she's cashing their checks. 
terrible. Yeah, yeah. Bad move. I bad. can only imagine where this is going to go. Bad, bad move. Yeah, yeah. So, oof, man. She was given five years probation in order to pay 4000 in restitution to her victims. Okay. Did it say how much she stole? Uh, it's the, uh, I, I would imagine probably around 4000 It had to be around 4000 if that's what she had to pay back yeah. in restitution. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, now that's not... I mean... It's bad. It is. But it's not like we're at the point where it's like $200,000 worth correct, of... Correct, 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 yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling we're getting there, though. I think so, probably. <laughs> yeah. So on January 16th, 1982, Puente picked up Malcolm McKenzie, age 74, from a bar and took him back to his, to his apartment. He reported that Puente had slipped something into his drink, date rape drug here, before robbing him of coins, watches, and other jewelry, including a diamond ring belonging to his mother which she removed from his finger while he was incapacitated. <laughs> Wait a minute. How old is this guy? 74. 74? And she's slipping date rape roofies mm. into yeah, his drink yeah, at a bar? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So no. she's, like, still got it. Yeah, like, yeah she's... I mean, I didn't realize that 74-year-olds went to the bar like this still, but... Well, I don't think she's 74 yet, but he was. Yeah. I, I okay. So she's working it. I she's get it. She's working it, yep. Yep. Well, she's learning things from her mom, and, you know, I'm sure. True. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, let's see, here we go. On April 28th, 1982, Ruth Monroe, 61, was found dead due to respiratory depression caused by a massive overdose of codeine. Ooh. Monroe was reportedly in good health when she arrived at Puente's home just over two weeks prior to her death. Oh, so she was like staying there. She was staying in one of the rooms? I guess so. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then by April 25th, she told a friend, I am so sick, I feel like I'm going to die. Damn. Monroe's death was originally ruled as undetermined overdose, but later classified as a homicide. Okay. So is this like if she was doing the poisoning or food or something? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Or drinks, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. This is going. Yep. So at this point right now, it's just an overdose. Okay. Homicide doesn't come till later. Right. Because this is this is what? This is like the first time there's a death involved yeah, yeah. with this first woman? Yeah, first time's a death, yeah. So they just think, oh, it's health problems, whatever. Yeah, she's an like overdose. 62 and, you know, and she probably, yeah, overdosed, unhappy in life or whatever. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so no suspicion yet on... No, 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 no. On Granny here. Yeah, Granny right now is still just a thief. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> just a thief. Just a thief. Well, and, and, a, and, a, and a date rape. Person. Yeah, but no one knows about that yet, right? Yeah, yeah. They no are, one knows about. Well, except him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. All right. Um, on May sixteenth. Yep, May sixteenth. Yeah. Sorry, my eyes. Nineteen eighty-two. Dorth, Dorothy Osborne, age forty-nine, found checks, credit cards, and other items missing. Uh, eight hours after Puente visited her home and prepared her a drink. Oh, so she's into this roofy, like she's roofing. She's roofing people. Okay. Playing uh-huh. it safe. I mean, at least they're she's not killing them. Well, well, one. Well, one, but we don't know that we yet. We don't know that yet. Yeah, yeah. But she's, it sounds like maybe in the beginning here, yeah. the intent isn't murder. Correct. It's to knock the person out. To, to get their money. To rob them. Yeah, to basically. rob them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can see how this might go south, though. It could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Drastically so, like really fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, in July of 82, Puente was convicted of three grand theft charges. She was sentenced to five years uh, in prison, state parole until March 21 of 86. And her federal parole sentence was extended another two years until 1990. Now, how old is she at this point? Oh, God. So, I keep saying granny because that's what we know her as, but is she younger here still, or is she in granny mode? I uh, see. So she was born in 21, and we're at 1990. So, yeah, she's getting pretty close to granny, getting closer into granny mode. Yeah, so she's 71? Yeah. Is that? Somewhere there, so roughly. If my, we're morons. Yeah. But I think yeah. that's the right math. <laughs> yeah, well, she looked like she was 70 in that picture, at least. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so during her incarceration, she began corresponding with Everson Theodore Gilmuth, a 77-year-old retiree from Oregon. Okay. So she's become a pen pal. <laughs> this guy. She's, oh, this is while she's in prison? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. God, a 73 year old is 77. 77 year old. Yeah. And she's 71. Mm-hmm. She's in prison and mm-hmm. she found a pen pal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's people out there that find that sexy. I know, but I always assumed younger. I didn't, I never. I, well, maybe he's home. He's lonely. That's true. Maybe through a church program, they do things for prisoners. <laughs> God, I hope. <laughs> I hope it wasn't through a church program, but I, just, I don't know. I guess I, I just envision, you know, it's kind of the thug life, a sexy thing. Yeah, but I think people looked at it maybe some a little different back then. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Sorry. No, no, no. You're fine. No, that's what we're about here. We got to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. All right. So at the beginning of September and uh, – wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, wait, yeah. At the beginning of September – of 1985, Gilmuth came to Sacramento with his truck and trailer and arrived at Puente's boarding house. This house? That house. Okay. Yep. Uh, Gilmuth, let's uh, see, Gilmuth came to Sacramento, okay, on uh, September 9th, 1985, sorry, I'm getting behind. After serving only half her sentence, Puente was released from prison, whereupon she was picked up by Gilmuth and Ricardo or Don. O R D O R I C A. Or Dara or Or Dara. Or Yeah. Or Something like that. Yeah. I was trying to be the badass. I just spit yeah, it out, yeah. but I couldn't do it. Or Dara. Yeah. Or Dorico. Or Dorica. Or Dorica. We'll go with that. Go with that. Yeah. Okay. A close friend who lived with his family in the downstairs flat at 1426 F Street. So basically in a downstairs flat. Did that place have a downstairs flat? I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Oh, wait, it was across the street, right? Okay. I think, yeah. Okay. In October of uh, 1985, Puente wrote to Gilmuth's Gilmuth's sister, informing her that she and Gilmuth were to be married on November 2nd. So, wait, she, not him, he doesn't write his own sister. No, she writes her. She writes his sister and says, hey, just so you know, we're getting married. Yes. Okay. And this is marriage number... Three? Yeah, should be. I think I think of my count. It's hard to keep track. Yeah. <laughs> I think it sounds like number three. I think it is. Okay. Okay. Maybe, yeah. So a short time later, Puente hired a handyman, Is- Ismail Carrasco Flores, for remodeling and asked him to build a six foot by thirty inch by thirty inch storage box. Okay. Six S- foot by thirty by thirty. Isn't that like the standard size of a coffin? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe a little bigger. <laughs> Somewhere like that. Six up by 30 by 30. I mean, that's a coffin. <laughs> but no, it's a storage box. Okay, I'm sorry. It's a yeah, storage box. Yeah. Okay, she agreed to give him Gilmas truck and $800 as payment. Okay. Well, she, Gilmas doesn't need the truck anymore. He's living with her, so what do they need the truck for? Or is there another reason he doesn't no, need the truck? No, no, no. Who so, knows? So... Wait, so hang on. Pump the brakes here for a second, Mike. Okay, yeah, pump the brakes. So she has she married this guy yet or just told people she's going to marry him? Well, she told the sister that she was going to marry okay. him. So she tells the sister he doesn't. Mm-hmm. She wants the coffin-sized box made mm-hmm. and is willing to pay using his truck. Mm-hmm. Where's he at? <laughs> it's kind of... I feel like I see where this is going. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I get it. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. All right. Exactly. Okay. Feel the same way, really. Yeah. He's really probably not. He's not probably within uh, the confines of knowing what he's doing anymore. Okay. So the day after he completed the box, he returned to find the box nailed shut. But this is the so, carpenter yeah, guy. Carpenter came back and he found out, found the box to be nailed up. Okay. And he didn't do it. No. So he didn't he's do like, it. "What the hell is this box doing all nailed up?" Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Quinty asked Flores to help her take the box, which now weighed approximately 300 pounds, to a storage location, <laughs> but ended up dumping the box near a river about an hour away from Sacramento. Was this guy not? He was given a truck, dude. Seriously? Uh, <laughs> I you just, think he's going to say anything? I'm just trying to. I would. Well, I mean. But he's probably illegal. He's he's, an, he's oh, okay. Hispanic. Could be illegal. I mean, maybe he's not here on his own. You know. I just can't imagine. Hey, I need you to build this coffin. I mean, storage, storage box, box. Excuse me. And then you show up the next day. It's nailed shut, and there's something in it that weighs 
250, 300 pounds. Well, which she had to put something else in there because, I mean, he's only 77. He could have been that heavy. Well, I'm thinking the box itself probably weighs yeah, 50 true. to it's 100 heavy. pounds, yeah. you know. So, like, this guy, there's no concern of, like, this looks like a coffin. Now it's nailed shut. And it's about the weight of having a body in it. Mm-hmm. And now she's going to go. She commissioned me to build the box, and now she wants help dumping it next to a river? <laughs> Okay. Okay. I digress. Yeah. All right. Well, it's it gets interesting. It gets interesting. Well, it's interesting already. I know. It gets worse. It, well, it, I don't know if it's worse. It just gets interesting. It does get worse. So on December 28th of 1998, it was determined that Gilmuth was the previously unidentified body discovered by a fisherman alongside the Sacramento River on July 1 of 86. Yeah. Gilmore's body was wrapped in numerous plastic bags and covered with a bed sheet. He is held in place by electrical tape. Mothballs, blue toilet deodorizer, uh, were also found inside the box. It was later <laughs> discovered that after Gilmore's death, Fuente mailed fake letters and cards to his sister in an attempt to make her believe that he was still alive. I feel like the mothballs are the clear indication it's an old lady. Mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, it's not, but I don't, for some reason, when you said mothballs, who else has mothballs but little old ladies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this guy, I mean, she killed him a long time ago. Yeah. She's just trying to keep him alive. And we probably, and you know why. For the checks, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, for his money. Okay, yeah. You don't want to report that. Yeah. I, mean, she, I don't know how much money that was. 600 bucks, whatever. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> here we go. Plenty was... uh also found to have forged Gilmas' signature on his truck certificate of title and continued cashing Gilmas' benefit checks until July of 86. Yeah. Yeah. So she collected his money for a little bit, got rid of him. Hmm. I, and I feel like, I feel like once you do it once. Oh, yeah. And you see the benefits. And you get a taste for it. You get a taste for it. You realize maybe how easy it was. Yeah. I feel like it's just going to snowball. Because mm-hmm. remember, she was just a thief, really, up to this point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, she liked to uh, roofie people. Well, yeah, and yeah. rob them. Rob them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, she's basically doing that with this guy's check. Yeah. Same difference, except yeah. she's killed him now. Well, yeah. At this point. Well, <laughs> To love and honor till death do you part. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in the fall of 86, Betty May Palmer, 78, arrived at Puente's boarding house. On February or on October 14th, 1986, Puente obtained a California ID with her photo in Palmer's name. How do you do that? <laughs> don't know. I'm not well, a- I'm thinking in the 80s too. I don't, I, the BMV, I'm sure, was not like how it is today. Oh, I'm sure it's not. Well, yeah, they weren't computerized. Well, and you probably didn't have to bring 37 yeah, pieces yeah, of, piece mail of mail and all that stuff. Yeah, there, it was probably minimal. Probably. She probably she probably got a hold of this lady's birth certificate or something. Yeah. And just, hey, yeah, this yeah, is me. Right, yeah. It's me. It was probably that easy back then. Yeah, probably was. Crazy. So two months later, the mailing address on Palmer's Social Security checks were changed to 20's F Street address. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see where this is going. Fuente forged Palmer's signature and cast nearly seven thousand dollars worth of benefit checks belonging to Palmer. Damn, seven grand. Yep. In November of nineteen eighty eight, Palmer's partially dismembered body was discovered in a shallow hole in Puente's front yard. Dang. The Her- little <laughs> I'm guessing that's that little Square of grass. Square of the grass, probably right there. Yeah, it's probably right in that, right in that front there. The now, way. obviously, this story's jumping around, right? It is. Like, yeah, like because it's not like they found this body and she was able to just continue. This is all they found. All the bodies at the end. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. So they're just basically we're just basically kind of letting you know like later down each the road. Victim. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I guess I should have stated that. No, it's okay. I just I was like, wait a minute. They find. Yeah. <laughs> they dig up a body in this lady's front yard, and she continues. But yeah, I guess we're getting basically an overview of each victim. Correct. And yeah. everybody's kind of found at the end. I, I get it now. I'm yeah. with it. So her hands, her head, hands, and lower legs were never found. 
So this old lady's not only killing people now, she's like dismembering she dismembered and her. Oh my goodness. It's that taste. It's what you're it's the escalation thing. Yep. Damn. Mm. Okay. She was identified on January 24th, 1989, through comparison to previous metal x rays. Okay. 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 All right. October 21st, 1986, Puente summoned a notary to the hospital room of Leona Carpenter, 78, following a Flores, Flores Pam overdose. She was given the power of attorney over Carpenter and began cashing her Social Security checks just 10 days later. So she's going to hospital rooms now and rushing notaries in there to have these incapacitated people sign over their life, basically? Well, I kind of have a feeling that she had a drug overdose. I wonder if she put her in the hospital. Oh, like it's one of the... It, they were staying at her yeah, boarding or, house. Yeah, somehow she roofied this later, got her to a drug overdose. Oh, my God. To get her in the hospital. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Crazy what money will do to people. It is. Yeah, yeah. So, in December, after Carpenter was released from the hospital, she went to live with Puente. Once again, Carpenter returned to the hospital, and just a few weeks after her discharge, in February of 87, she disappeared. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In November of 1988, her body was found in the southeastern corner of Puente's yard. Toxicology reports of Carpenter's brain tissue revealed the presence of codeine, dizepam, and florezepam. Dang, so she is loading She made down a cocktail. She made her a cocktail. Yeah. And Damn. she's burying them all in the front yard. That's not a big yard, dude. It's That's what I'm wondering. Where are they? But sh- yeah. Where are they all going? And she's an old, how the hell is she lifting these people and doing all this work? Well... She hired the other guy, so maybe she's got help we don't know about, someone she's hiring and giving away. Maybe it's her daughter come back around, the one she Mm -hmm. gave away to. I don't don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm sure her daughter's never came back around. No, I I I wouldn't have. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you gave me away. F*** you. Yeah. Peace out. Peace out. Yep, I'm out. Never come back. (laughs) Okay, so in February of 87, James Gallup... 62, he moved into Puente's home. And then on July 20th, 1987, a potentially malignant tumor was found in Gallup's colon. He agreed to further testing, but Puente later contacted... Got to turn a page, sorry. Turn page, page turn break? Yep, turn page break, sorry. Hold on. Later contacted his doctor's office, notifying them that he had gone to Los Angeles indefinitely. Okay, so this guy's diagnosed <laughs> with cancer. Yes. And then when he's supposed to go get treatment, she calls this place and is like, oh, he's not coming. He decided to go somewhere else. Yes. Forever. Forever. He's gone. He's never going to come back. Never come back. Yep. He doesn't want to use you as for his medical treatment. Correct. And really, I don't know how you could come back. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Gallup's body was found buried under a gazebo in Puente's yard in November of 88. Is that towards the back there? Could be. Yeah. Looks like a little gazebo there. Well, she's running out of room (laughs) because if that's all she's got. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, toxicology testing of Gallup's brain and liver revealed the presence of amitriptyline, uh, nortripoline. I'm probably saying these all wrong. Fen- fitin- They'll let us know. Yeah, fentanyl and florizapan. I see the comments now. Yeah, yeah, here they all come. All you my can- nurses are going to be like, dude, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> just from now on, just say lethal cocktail. Yeah, lethal cocktail. There you go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Man. All right. So that's another one. Yeah. Yeah. She's stacking them up. I don't know where she's. I don't know where she's stacking them up. Yeah. I don't know what she's she, stacking them up. Well, I guess if you take the limbs off the one, it, it frees up a little space. God. Unfortunately. Jeez. Yeah. I don't know these people. Mm. It's sad. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, excuse me, guys. In July of 87, that was a piece of coming back up. Uh, Eugene Gamble, 58, was found dead of an apparent suicide, having overdosed on amphetamine and ethanol. Another overdose. At what point are the authorities going to be like, what's with all these overdoses well, at old, this house? Well, but they're old people. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe a lot of people when they get that age are like, you know, I'm tired of living. Yeah, but you would think all at the same address. I don't know. It would raise some. You would think raise some red flags. You think? Yeah. Must have been that local law enforcement there. Well, and really, uh, maybe it did. But when they go and they meet little Miss yeah, Congeniality, yeah, yeah. that's she like some cookies and tea. I mean, if you think about it, it's the perfect cover because even if even if the cops are like, "All right, lady." What's going on with your house here? We got all these. Oh, well, I run a boarding house for troubled, you know, people that have yeah, issues, issues, addiction issues, whatever. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it I, is like, I help them with their social security payments and all this. And Yeah. I give them a place to stay. I feed them. Yeah. It's like the perfect cover. Cause as soon as you would tell me, oh, well, it's like, it's a, you know, it's a boarding house for troubled individuals. Mm-hmm. I, well, of course you're going to have a lot of runs there and, Possible suicides or overdoses or I, yeah, I get whatever, it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Good cover. Yeah. She was smart on this one. Uh-oh. What'd she do with this? No, I'm just saying, just the, this this program that she's got going on, it's actually, I mean, you're cashing people's Social Security checks. Yeah. She's got a good gig going right now. Yeah. I mean, fortunately. All right. So Puente, who was Gamble's landlady, <laughs> said he had a history of suicide attempts. Though Puente was never charged with Gamble's murder, he was considered a possible victim. Oh, I think he's most definitely a victim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. On October 2nd, 1987, Vera Faye Martin, 61, was sent to live with Puente. So this lady was sent to live with Puente. Okay. I don't know why. But well, but I'm thinking if she's got the reputation. Yeah, true. She got the reputation. She's a, yeah. You, you get to the point where people are like, oh, if you got a family member needs help, this is a great place to yeah, send yeah, them yeah. to that she helps these people out. Yeah, she helps out with their money and they're spending their finances and their, you know, all that free place to stay or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. You know, what makes me sick about this story is these were all vul- vulnerable people. Correct. You know, this is almost as bad as kids. Yeah. It really is. Being victim, because these are people that probably honestly needed help yeah. with whatever. Like we were talking about addiction or homelessness or whatever. Yeah, whatever the case. And she is taking the ultimate advantage yep. of them. Mm-hmm. And, chat, and taking their money and eventually, when she needs to make room for somebody new, I guess. Yeah. Kill one off. Or, you know, someone maybe catches on. Yeah. That's kind of my question with these is, is she keeping them alive for the money? And as soon as they start wondering... Or a family hey, member. Aren't you, you know, I, I filled out this paperwork so you could help me with getting my social security money, but you haven't given me, any, you know, where is my, and then she's like, oh. Yep, time to go. Time to go. Yep. Time to get another person in here because this one's on to me, kind of. Yep. I don't want to say anything to her brother or son when he comes and sees me. Right. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Could be. You're right. Okay. So anyway, so we got Vera, my, Vera Faye Martin. Um, Puente forged a number of Martin's Social Security checks totaling $7,000. See, she doesn't really spend – it's like that $7,000 is like a cap. Yeah. You know, she didn't go very – didn't go too high on the money. Well, I'm but wondering, I, though – But if you stay under a certain amount, I guess eyes don't look. Well, I'm also thinking, too, is that the amount where we have reached the amount of time where these people are questioning her? Could be. Do you true. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, she can kind of BS her way through a couple months' worth of checks. True. But then, you know, once you're hitting month three and four and this person's like, where the hell is my money at that you're helping me with? Yeah. Maybe that's kind of the limit where she knows that's yeah. when I got to get rid of them because they're going to report me or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. On October 19th, 1987, Martin failed to contact her daughter on her birthday, which she had done each year. So every year for her daughter's birthday, she always contacts her. But this year in 87, she didn't. So clear signal to daughter that something's wrong. Something's up. Yeah. 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 So in November of 1988, I graduated high school that year. Uh, God, you're old. I know. Martin's body was found buried under a metal shed in Puente's yard. Toxicology <laughs> reports of her brain and liver revealed fluorazepam. Where, Mike? <laughs> Where in this yard does she? She must have uh, places. That, I don't know. Unless she's stacking them. Oh, that could be. I Maybe she think buried them deep the first time around. And they're on top of each other. God, that's terrible. I'm mean, asking. Mm. I'm trying to figure out how a seventy year old lady's digging trenches. Yeah, that's I mean, that's a lot of digging, and nobody noticing. I mean, she got neighbors. 
<laughs> you would think you could see how on top of all the houses. Yeah, you think is. somebody will buy, buy and be like, "Hey, what, what's up? What are we doing in your yard?" Yeah, it's not like she's out in the boondocks. She's in the middle of Sacramento, California. Yeah, on a main street, right? Like downtown street. Well, I will say this: she, um, it looks to be a very well manicured house True. and property. And she is a matron of the of the uh, town or city. So I'm thinking, if I'm a neighbor of this lady, and she is constantly out in her yard digging, I'm not thinking up because she's gardening. She's all you know. She's got flowers and bushes, and you know what I mean. I just think it's an old woman that's obsessed with her yard. But if she's digging like there in the corner and never puts anything there, I'd be a little like, what? She dug up all this spot and didn't put nothing in other that's, than grass. That's true. You know what I mean? But I think that just goes back to the little old lady thing. Even yeah, if you had an you would inkling, never think bad, anything bad. Yeah, even if you were like, "That's odd that she dug that up and put it just right back the way it was," but then you're like, "Yeah, but it's a little old lady. Yeah. Well, she can't be up to anything." Yeah, yeah, she's mm. bored. She's bored, really bored. <laughs> okay, so on October twenty first, let's see, we go to nineteen eighty seven. Dorothy Miller, sixty five, was placed in an upstairs flat in Puente's home. So Dorothy Miller, new lady. 65. Okay. She comes to live there. Uh, she's introduced, to, she introduced Miller to Richard, oh, here we go, uh, Ordo or Rico or whatever the guy's name is, the one we couldn't figure out. Yeah. And following, in the following November, Ordo Rico became the representative payee for Miller's Social Security benefits. Interesting. Yeah. Mm hmm. Just weeks after her arrival, Miller had disappeared, and on November 20th, 1987, Puente hired a carpenter, a carpet cleaner, to remove a large pile of foul-smelling slime in Miller's room. A large pile of foul-smelling slime? <laughs> well, human bodies, after a while, do tend to leave a I know, but even liquid. this guy now doesn't think anything of this? Well, he's making money. I know, Mike, but you're telling me if you were a plumber or something and you get called to a house and there's a giant spot on the floor, it looks like a dead body's been there and they're asking you to clean it up. I mean, I get you want to make the money, but don't you also make a phone call after you leave? You would think so. You would think. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I think it's just a little lady thing. Yeah, I'm yeah, telling you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the old lady could be like, yeah, I had cats. <laughs> Uh, had 25 cats. City just took them away. This is where they all pottied. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think this, I think all of this is a circumstance of the little kind little old lady. Mm -hmm. I feel like this spot could have been an obvious blood spot. And I still don't think, I still think the person would. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. well, it can't be anything bad. It's, mm -hmm. it must be paint. Yeah. It's a little lady. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Puente, oh, Puente continued to forge Miller's checks, totaling over 11000 Ooh, she's moving up. Moved up a little bit here after she was no longer at the house. Miller's remains were later discovered buried under a slab of concrete near some rose bushes. Okay. Tissue samples uh, from Miller's brain revealed the presence of... Uh, Lethal drugs. Lethal drugs. Yeah. Drug cocktail. Very big drug cocktail. Yeah. So another overdose. Yes. Okay. Mm hmm And yeah, now we're buried them under concrete. Yeah. We're doing the John Gotti. Yeah. That, maybe this little walkway slab or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. God, how many more? I don't know. Not that I want you to be done. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm just like, when is this woman going to get caught? Exactly. You know, I mean, mm. this is insane. You would think the people that stand there, are people there would, after a while, be like, God, you know, people die there <laughs> awful quick. But that's what I'm saying. Like, the neighbors have to be like, there's an ambulance here every other day. No, they're not. Oh, the, oh duh. She put them in the ground. Duh. Or boxes. That was a dumb thing to say, Andy. <laughs> but I see what you're saying. Like, you start seeing new faces, then all of a sudden you don't see the. But again, it's a boarding house run by a little old lady. Yeah, but still, you. So you, the assumption would be okay, someone came, they stayed for two weeks, and they don't need to, they found a place, and they. that's why we don't see them anymore. Yeah, but man, 
if if I put my mom there, I think I'd be going. You know, my dad was in his, in the thing. I was there every day. Well, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people, people that just don't care that yeah. don't have families that true give a shit about them. You know. Yeah. I don't know. Crazy, crazy. Man, she likes that. That Floreza pan, boy, she must have a, she's got a lot of this stuff on stock. Where do you even buy that at? Well, you have all these old people in there. She probably got all these drugs she collects. A lot of these people come in on all kinds of whatever. True. So, yeah, she probably got a, she probably got a nice little uh, prescription fraud ring she could be running if she really wanted to. True. So, <clears throat> so on Jan- so November 29th, 1987. Brenda Trujillo sent a letter to the Social Security office in Sacramento accusing Puente of stealing her Social Security checks totaling $3,500. Yeah. Trujillo met Puente in the Sacramento Sacramento County Jail in 1982, and the two later shared a prison cell. Okay, so this is where our little old lady messes up, though. Mm Mm-hmm. So she shares a prison cell with this lady and later tries to steal her social security. So, of course, the other criminal is going to be like, I know what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So this was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like the beginning of the end here. After Trillo, uh, let's see, what did I say? After her release, Trillo moved into Puente's boarding house. Oh, my God. (laughs) Where Puente helped her apply for social security benefits. Ugh. Trujillo claimed that Puente drugged her and called her parole officer, causing her parole to be revoked before Trujillo just received the checks. (laughs) At least she didn't kill her. Yeah. I mean, got her thrown back in prison probably, but at least she didn't kill her. she didn't kill her. Yeah. Her checks just went to her house and she cashed them. Right. Well, she's in prison. What's she going to do? Yeah, what's she going to do? Who's going to believe her? Yeah. Damn. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. So in February 1988, Alv- Alvaro Bert Gonzalez Montoya, 51, okay. arrived at Puente's home. In March, an associate, an, as- an application desi- uh, designating Puente as uh, Montoya's benefits payee was filed. At the end of August, a roommate saw a man cleaning, uh, clearing Montoya's clothes out of the closet. Um, he had missed an appointment on August 29th and was last seen on o- August 24th. Okay. Puente told several people that Montoya went to Mexico to visit his relatives. Clearly he did not. Social workers continued to attempt to contact. Now, here we got social workers involved. Uh Social workers continued to attempt to contact Montoya in September and October to no avail. Okay. So in November, Puente asked Donald Anthony, a former convict who had been working in her yard, to contact Social worker pretending to be Montoya's brother in law. Okay, <laughs> we're getting deep into the lies here. Uh, he agreed and called, stating his name was Mikel Obregon and that he had picked up Montoya from the F Street house and took him to Utah. So, <laughs> divert all attention. So, we're no longer actually going to Mexico. Now we're in Utah. Right. Which is it? Utah and Mexico. No, nah, yeah. you got to keep your story straight. It gets you in trouble. Yep. The social worker was suspicious and told Puente that she was going to call the police. Ooh. Mm. Don't know if I'd have told her that. Yeah. So, so on 10 November, so the social worker received a letter pur- pur- purportedly from, uh, from uh, uh, Mikel Obergon wrapped in a paper towel to avoid fingerprints. <laughs> Could you be any more obvious? Yeah. Days later, Montoya's body was found buried adjacent to Carpenter. Oh, and Carpenter's the social worker? No, Carpenter was one of the other victims. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. He was found in the yard. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. Toxicology testing revealed the presence of loxapine, lorazepam, uh, a big, this one was a big cocktail. So she. Oh, found, there's a lot of things in this one, cocktail. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So five, she really five wanted. Yeah, five different drugs were found in this guy. She was guaranteeing his death, basically. Mm, yeah. 
Montoya had prescriptions for all of the drugs except for the carb mazepine. Okay. So basically she killed him on his prescription drugs. Jesus. So on March 9th, 1988, Benjamin Fink, 55, was sent to live with Puente. Fink's brother visited him on a weekly basis for six weeks. Okay. So this guy's getting visitors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by the end of April, Fink was gone. <laughs> Uh, wait, gone? Gone, yeah. Wait, gone, disappeared, or moved out? Well, another tenant reported smelling a foul odor emanating from his room, but was told by Puente that it was a sewer backup. Dang, so she's getting bold, because this guy has a visitor every week. Every week. So well, For the first six weeks. So this isn't some forgotten Mm-mm. person. Yeah, he's got a brother. Skim bold, man. Yep. Mm-hmm. Never good. That leads to being caught. Yep. So on April 29th, Puente received 12 bags of cement. That June, she had a, had a hole dug next to the door of the metal shed, which was later filled in with concrete. Okay. Okay. So see right there, she had she's hiring people to Yeah. Yeah. So in November, Fink's body was discovered in this area. Uh, wrapped in plastic knotted bedspread, secure with duct tape and covered up with blue absorbent pads. They're oh, like puppy pads? Uh, or, yeah, I guess. Yeah. His toxicology report revealed he, the presence of amitriptyline, loxapine, fluorazepine, pam, the typical cocktail. All the good stuff. Yeah, basically what she's doing to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Okay. So November 7th, 1988. <laughs> just, you realize what you're about to read and just shake your head. Uh, just, just, this, this story, it just when I first saw this, I, I knew this was going to be. I didn't read the whole thing. I started just, I read a part of it and I was like, yeah, this will be a good one. Yeah, it is. But I didn't realize it was going to be this good. Yeah, this yeah. is a lot of people. This is going on for a long period of time without. Yeah. I mean, and there's near misses because you got people complaining to Social Security office. Mm-hmm. You got the social worker that was calling the police. Yep. You got this last guy whose brother was showing up every week. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. We're getting bold, but she's still going. And you're telling doctor's offices that, you know, a guy has got a tumor. Right. He's not going to come in for treatment. He decided. He decided we go to LA. He doesn't need any treatment. Yeah, He's going to go live his life in LA, yeah. get some chicks, whatever. 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 He wants to die. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is nuts. <laughs> yeah. Nuts. Can you imagine, like, can you imagine being, like, the grandson of this woman? Mm-hmm. After, like, after she's caught and it comes out, everything has happened. Can you imagine this being your grandma? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know what You know what I'd be doing? What? Calling Netflix. <laughs> oh, signing. Yeah. Signing, signing the deal. Yeah. God, I just can't. <laughs> I just can't imagine this being my grandma, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but she didn't really have, we don't know if she had any grandkids because really, I mean, she gave her daughters away. That's true. So on November 7th, 19, 1988, police spoke with John Sharp, a former resident, about the disappearance of Montoya. So we're back on Montoya. Okay, and the police are involved. The police yeah, are. The social worker obviously is. Hot on the trail. Hot on the trail. Okay. Initially, Sharp told police that he had seen Montoya uh, two days earlier, but then slipped a note to the officer that said, she wants me to lie to you. Oh, because she's right there. Mm-hmm. So she, he's got to lie. Probably. Because she's to, standing there listening. Because he probably knows what's going on. He's afraid to say anything because he didn't want to be the next one to go. Right. So he lies, but, all, but slips a note that's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's making me do this. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. He later met with an officer to tell his story. Um, on, over, on November, ugh, I can't talk. On November eleventh, nineteen eighty-eight, a detective returned to Puente's residence with her permission. Began digging in areas that appeared to be recently disturbed. Thirty minutes later, he discovered the first body. Dang. God, what was she thinking? Letting it? Well, I mean, I get the whole trying to portray that you're innocent sure come on over yeah you can dig around mm-hmm. but when they're not buried that deep i guess yeah 30 minutes 30 minutes <laughs> 30 minutes of poking around and, poking around, and we've, we, got, we've body got body 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. Halt everything. Let's get a let's get a warrant. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So let's see here. So we got a body. Um, Puente, however, slipped away from the police. How do you lose track of her? Well, they're too busy looking around. So she she probably saw him yeah. go into that area and thought, oh, "I'm out." Well, well, I guess if you're digging recently disturbed earth, you're thinking there may be bodies. You would think that you'd keep an eye. Yeah, you think you would have brought some people to keep an eye on her, right? Uh, yeah, whatever. In case you find what you think you're going to find, do you know? Yeah, yeah. So on November 13, 1988, an all points bulletin was issued for Puente because now she's gone. Yeah. So on November 16, 1988, Charles Wig Wiggles, along with Gene Silver of CBS, alerted police to Puente's whereabouts at a motel in Los Angeles. Okay. Wiggles met Puente, who was using the alias Donna jo Johansson. So she's back to Johansson's name. Okay. But different first name. Um, the day before at a nearby bar. He later recalls seeing on, on a CBS morning newscast and reached out to Gene Silver, who met with Wiggles at his apartment. Two contacted local uh, law enforcement, and Puente was arrested the same day. Okay. So they got her. Yeah. So now, now we're in custody. Okay. Now, I did see something on this, kind of going back a little bit, about the time where the police came in, I think. Before that, I guess she was still on parole during this whole time. Oh, from like the previous yeah. robberies or whatever? And parole came by only one time to do a check on her. Really? Now, when parole comes around... I mean, what what do you do? Just go and have coffee and tea with her and be like, okay, we're done. See you later. I'm not going to look around. I guess. And well, and if they only came once, it must have been one of the times there wasn't a smell in the house or anything. I guess. Ooh. Yeah. See, and how many of these stories do we tell where there are missed opportunities? Oh, yeah. For these people to get caught. Yeah. Either before any crimes mm -hmm. of murder are committed or... yeah. Like a, and, you, and you think if she got to this many people, I mean, going back, wonder how many she had. Because obviously. Yeah, you know, like were there more before she was in this house yeah, that are buried at that, some other house? Or? Yeah, or that she just gave uh, roofies to that the roofies were a little too too strong or whatever. I don't know. Right. Pretty crazy. So now we go to the trial and conviction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I did find this for you. If, oh, these are, yeah, these were the victims. These are the victims here. Yeah. Who we got? We got so Martin, we got, Palmer, Gilmuth, Gallup, Monroe, Miller. So Gilmuth was the one she married. He's the one in the top right, Everson Gilmuth. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And then there's the late uh, James Gallup. And so Montoya, that's the one that got her in trouble. Okay. Alvaro. Oh. Wow. Seven of Dorothea's Puente's murder victims. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. But if you look at them, I mean, you can tell these are, a lot of these folks are elderly. You can tell some of them have some physical. Yeah. Like James Gallup. Yep. I can see how they could be taken advantage of. Mm hmm But sad that, that it you is. know, you go after. Yep. And like even Everson Gilmuth. I mean, he met her as a pen pal and he left Oregon to marry her. Now, let's talk about. Everson here, you know, I get that he may not have known she was a murderer, but you started being pen pals. She was in prison, but she was in prison for just money. For robbery or Rob whatever, well, forgery, yeah, forgeries. But still, you knew you were getting into a relationship with a criminal. At least, sure, yeah. I, I guess you don't make the jump to she's also a murderer. But yeah, I, you. <laughs> Your relationship started when you were in prison. I mean, yeah, I, I know. You know, like I don't. This is why I don't start pen pal relationships with. Yeah, never. Yeah, exactly. Female inmates at a prison yeah. because you never know what could. Yeah, what could exactly. come of it. So, I don't know. Well, maybe you know, maybe Everson went to that prison to visit somebody, and he saw her and thought, "Oh, I like this woman." But knew she was an inmate is my point. I know. Knew she's a criminal. Yeah. Oh, Everson. Smooth criminal. <laughs> Let's never do that. No. Let's no. never sing again. No. That's, okay. that's it for my singing career. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So on November 17th, 1988, Puente was flown from Hollywood Burbank Airport to Sacramento. Okay. Escorted by police. 
and booked in the county jail. She was then formally charged with the murder of Montoya. Okay, just Montoya? At this point, yes. Okay, so they really only got enough for one at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Okay. On March 10th of 89, criminal charges against Flores were dismissed due to the statute of limitations expiring three years after Gilma's body was discovered. So the guy that built the box was... They had to let him go. There's a statute of limitations for murder in California? Uh, I don't know if it's... I don't know. He was uh, later granted immunity for... Oh, well, he was given her. Okay, so... Statute of limitations expiring three years after his, the body was found, was discovered, and Flores also was later granted immunity for his testimony against Puente. So uh, okay. the, the the guy who built the box and stuff. The, the statute of limitations was going to expire three years after. Gotcha. Yeah, because not the time for frame, her. For, yeah, not for her. But since he his assistance in it, and since he uh, you know, was granted, he basically was granted him the immunity for his testimony. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, if you spill the beans. We won't charge it. Yeah. So that way they can get her for another trip. Yeah. 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 So on March, uh, so here we go, March 31st, uh, 1989, an amended amended complaint was filed charging Puente with nine counts of murder with special circumstance qualifying it as a death penalty case. Oh, so she might get the. Mm Mm-hmm. And you know, really, she's a, basically she she fits the the param- parameters for a uh, serial killer. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent, she's yeah. a serial killer. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't think one of the requirements is that there has to be yeah, I no reason. No, I'm not giving you crap. I'm just saying, like, I get that she was doing it for the money, mm-hmm. but still, a serial killer. Still, yeah, it, it yeah. doesn't have to be a psychopath that kills yeah. for no reason. Well, she is. She's a pathological liar, and she does have a disorder. She is, but I'm just saying, you know, compared to, like, Ted Bundy, there's oh, no yeah. rhyme or reason. Yeah. He just hunts women. You know, they don't... That's not the only thing that would make a serial killer. She's clearly... It's. I mean, she's killed more than three separate people mm-hmm. in three separate incidents. They never which, labeled her as a serial killer. They never did, really? I don't think so. Dang. Well, she is in our books. Yes. You heard you heard it here first. Yeah, she's serial killer. Two murder serial, morons yep. is saying that Dorothea Puente is serial killer. Serial killer. Yes. Okay. All righty. What a mess. Okay, so where are we at? Um according to investigators, most of the her victims have been drugged until they overdosed. So basically she drugged them up until they overdosed. Wendy then wrapped them in bed sheets and plastic lining before dragging them to open pits in the backyard for burial. So she had open pits already. She was ready for them. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. By May 24, 1990, the prosecutor rested his case, having called 71 witnesses and in introducing 108 exhibits in the preliminary hearing. And then on June 19, 1990, a judge ruled that there was ample circumstantial evidence to send Puente to trial. And on July 31st, 1990, Puente pleaded not guilty. She pleads not guilty. <laughs> yeah. Shoot your shot, I guess. Yep. Oh, drop something. Sorry. Uh-huh. Technical malfunction. <laughs> it's okay. What'd you drop over there? Yeah, my babe. Oh. <laughs> now, you know, my crutch. Yeah. So, as she pleads not guilty, after numerous delays, on October 19th, 1992, a judge ruled that Puente would face all nine murder counts and that all cases would be heard in Monterey County. Okay. Okay. So then on December 21st, 1992, 12 jurors consisting of eight men and four women were selected for Puente's trial. The following month, six alternate jurors, five women and one woman, or one man, were selected to back up the 12 regular. Okay. Puente's trial began on February 9th, 1993, and by the cl- conclusion of the trial, 156 witnesses testified more than 3,100 3, exhibits had been submitted, and over 22,000 pages of transcript were recorded. Good Lord. So this is a big trial. Big this trial. is a lot of witnesses and pieces of evidence. Yes. Well, you're calling them sure, family members. and Oh, yeah. you got to call in people for, the, for uh, the Social Security office. Yeah, I think all the paperwork that was evidence. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Man. After deliberating for 11 days on 
On August 2, 1993, the jury told Judge Michael J. Verga, V-I-R-G-A, just in case I said it wrong, uh, that they were deadlocked on all nine counts. Are you shitting me? Mm -hmm. They're deadlocked? On nine counts of murder and asked for further instruction. Oh, man. How? Well, because I'm sure on some of those it was circumstantial evidence. Okay. So did they receive... So they're trying to decide whether she's guilty of all of them or none of them. Mm -hmm. And there may be a couple there that they're like, well... Good question to give up. Okay. I see. So they want some different juror instructions to maybe break down each victim or Probably, something? yeah, to get okay. a better sense of it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's hope that knocks some sense. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, the next day, Verga ordered the jury to resume their efforts to break the deadlock. Okay. I guess that's the instructions. <laughs> Thanks, Judge. Thanks, Judge. Appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah. His <laughs> Judge, we're deadlocked. We can't come to a decision. We need further instructions. We'll and go back in there and figure it out. <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. That's where the yeah. That's the instructions they got. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Thanks Judge. Okay. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Alrighty. So then on August 26, 1993, Puente was convicted on three counts of murder. Okay. So at least they got her on a couple of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Benjamin Fink, Leona Carpenter, and Dorothy Miller. Those are the th uh, three counts of murder. Yeah, so they got her, on, got her for Fink, Carpenter, and Miller. Okay. And the case started out with Montoya. That's funny. Okay. Okay. Um, well, three should do it. Yeah, three I should mean, do it. I mean, yeah. I mean, you want right. justice for every victim, Correct. but three should put her away for, I mean, look well, at this little old lady. Yeah, put her away for life, right. whatever life she's got left. Yeah, so uh, so she got that. Um, the jury, after deliberating for 35 days, remained deadlocked on six cases. Ruth Monroe, Everson Theodore Gilmuth, Betty Mae Palmer, James Gallup, uh, Vera Faye Martin, and Alvaro Gonzalez Montoya. So those were the ones they couldn't, that was the ones they were deadlocked on. Which, you know, I, I, I get a jury trying to be fair and saying, hey, well, in these cases the evidence is too circumstantial. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if you're going to find her guilty of three of them with this pattern and the other people fit the pattern. Correct. You know, how do you say, well, we're not sure on the other ones. Do you know what I'm, you yeah, see what I'm saying? But yeah. They're all found in the same place. Right. And in the same, same drugs yeah. use same. Yeah. They're buried in her damn yard. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't get it either. But again, at least but I wasn't three. There. Yeah, three. I mean, good. I figured at least one would be good because with her being her age, yeah, any sentence over ten or twenty years is going to be a life sentence. So at least get one. Yep. So during the penalty phase of the trial, jurors found themselves deadlocked once again. I'm like, what's a sentence, sir? Yep. Good lord. On October thirteenth, nineteen ninety three, Puente was spared the death penalty. Okay. Because of them being deadlocked. On December 10th, 1993, she was sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. She was incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California. Okay. On August 28th, 1997, an appellate court in San Jose affirmed Puente's murder convictions, but ordered an examination of juror misconduct allegations. Oh, Lord, here we go with this. After a three-day hearing on September 25th, 1998, Judge Curtis rejected each allegation of jury misconduct in Puente's trial. Okay, so he rejected that. Yeah. Okay. So it stands. She's a murderer. She's a murderer. She's a serial killer, Mike. Yep. We have, we have dubbed her as such. Yep. On March 27th, 2011... At the age of 82, she died of natural causes in Calchula. Okay, so she died in prison. Yep. What a sick story, man. It is. It really is. What a sick. Yeah. yeah I mean, you think, I mean, I give her, I mean, I'm not saying I'm giving her credit, but she was smart in the beginning of what she was doing uh, in her aspect of what she wanted to achieve, I guess. 
Right, but which she, was the money. But she got really sloppy. Yeah. Isn't that what they all mm-hmm. kind of fall into? That's yeah. how they all get caught. Of course. They always do something wrong. I feel like if she would have kept with the original plan, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe also found somewhere else to put the bodies. Or, probably, probably. Or instead of putting the bodies, just continue with the story of the, it's a flop house type place, you know, or not a flop house, but like a rehab house. Yeah. And they're, these people are overdosed and they got problems. I'm a boarding house. Yeah. Call an ambulance every time they're dead. Yeah. You know, but I guess that probably maybe would not But then you can't keep getting the money. True. Because once you report them dead. Yeah, the money stops. So security gets, I mean, they'll get notified of the death. But then you just get somebody new in there. And you, you just would. keep repeating the, like she was kind of doing in the beginning. Yeah. Crazy. I did find, so this is a, this is from uh, Ghost Adventures, a okay. travel channel. Yeah. This is, this is all I knew. You know, I watched this episode where they did like a, a paranormal investigation in the house. Okay. Which you should definitely check out. It's a good episode. They get a lot of, get a lot of action there. Yeah. I think they get some, you know, voices and stuff, but. Um, and it's just cool to see the, ins- you know, they obviously go inside and you get to see the inside of the house and mm-hmm. what the rooms look like. And they, you know, they kind of told the story and they said like this, if I remember right, you know, this is where this, vic- this was this victim's room or this was her room or, or whatever. This is where the sticky carpet was. But yeah, so this is, this was my knowledge base of this episode. I didn't know anything other than what they said during this Ghost Adventures, Adventures episode, but it is a good thing to check out. Like if you're into the story and you want to see the inside of the house, like for our listeners and viewers, yeah, check it out. And there's a story also on uh, Dorothea that's on a uh, channel. It's on a show on Netflix. It's a uh, something about a roommate. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Oh, is it the? Sh- it's like my roommate's a murderer or yeah. something. Yeah. I think that's something the name like that. of the show. Yeah. yeah, she's on that. They do an episode yeah, about they do her. An episode on her. Okay, so check that out. Yeah, on Netflix, you can find out a little bit more about her. This is uh, that's uh, her prison photo. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't look so sweet anymore. No, she now right there. She looks like a criminal. You know, isn't it crazy? Because I feel like every episode we've done so far, we have these pictures of these people while they're alive yeah. before they're caught. And then I always try to end it with a prison photo. Most of them look like pretty normal, likable people yeah. until the prison. And then I feel like the prison photo, te- it's like they've been caught and they're not wearing that mask mm-hmm. anymore. Yep. And it's like, this is what the true person looks like Yep. on the inside. Now they look at on the outside, you know, because mm-hmm. she looks evil there. Yeah, she does. You know? Yep. Like I would want to run in. This is no longer the lady I want bringing me cookies. No, like no, I no, said no, in the no, beginning, no, 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 you know? no, no, no. This is the this is the witch. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 yeah crazy to take crazy, advantage. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Stay away from her. No. Yeah. That was a good one. That is a good one. You know what time it is? Oh. Wheel of death. Wheel of death, baby. We got a player. No. Huh? No. We do not have a player. Why do you always tease me? Well. In order to get, get players, me excited, you get me all excited. <laughs> no. Well, in order to get players, we gotta have people sign up. So we gotta exactly. we gotta advertise. That's that, true. You know what I'm true, saying? True. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go, people. Come on. If you want to play the Wheel of Death, possibly get some two MM merch. Yeah. Go to our website, two murdermorons.com, and That's there right. you'll find a sign up form where you can sign up to be on the show, play the Wheel of Death. Yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't. I don't either. It's we, simple. We have so many cool things to give away too. Exactly. You get a free membership and get all the bonus episodes. Yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't wouldn't want that. I don't know why we haven't had millions yet. I know. You know? I'm shocked. (laughs) I'm not. Oh, oh, (laughs) I'm not either, but (laughs) it would be nice to have one or two. I mean, we've had. We've had a couple so far. So far. So if you you, um, go back, this is the first episode of ours that you're watching, go back and watch some of the previous ones. Deaths at Disney, there's, we play on there. If you kind of want to see how it goes yeah yeah we but, had two uh, two uh nice souls come along and want to play yeah yeah it's a good time yeah uh so if you enjoyed this episode you like to support the show head to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons yep you can simply buy mike and i and coffee or you can sign up to be a member for exclusive benefits like the bonus the episodes, bonus episodes. We keep talking about yep and you uh, can do that for as little as three dollars yeah three bucks a month yeah, three bucks a month. You get a bonus. You get we do two bonus episodes a month every other week. Yeah, three bucks a month. That's that's coffee at Starbucks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
And if you don't want to do a membership thing, consider some merch. Yeah. I mean, who would not want a pair of boxers with our photos on? That's true. There is a pair of boxers that has Mike's face. Yeah. I mean, who would not? I mean, <laughs> seriously, people. <laughs> Who would not want something like that? I personally own a pair. Yeah, you do. I do. You're, you're, you I show you showed them off on the show. I show. Well, it's a bonus. Episode. So there. There. Yep. If you want to see me in some spandex boxers, with Mike's yeah, face with on my the face front on of me. It. There you go. Uh, become a member and yeah. <laughs> check out that bonus episode. But um, yeah, if you're not into that, it would help us out. If you want a shirt or a hat, hat hats are like awesome. That. Hats. There are a lot cool. of requests for the hats. You can go to two murder morons dot com or scan the QR code. You almost messed up again. I did. I was so close to saying mortar again. Mm-hmm. Two murder morons dot com. Oh man. Speaking, I, I'm representing today our show sponsor. Yeah. Trailblazer Threads. Yep. There's my I'm sexy and I tow it. I my, tow it. My RV shirt. But uh, they got some funny shirts there too. So link in the description. Check out Trailblazer Threads. Yep. Check them out. What else? We got anything else? Oh. Oh. Take a moment to like, subscribe, and follow. Yes. No matter what, uh, what, what your platform you're on. Yeah. Whatever yep. your platform calls it, please do that. That's the free way to support us. It helps us you know, promote the show through the different algorithms and whatnot. So before you click off of us. Yeah, just a good old like. You, yeah. you know, subscribe if you like. Make a comment. Yeah. Something we need to do better. If, something you don't, you know, whatever. If you're watching on YouTube, click the notification bell. And you get notified every time we yeah. put a new episode up. Yeah. Helps us out. And then, you know, if you found that you like Andy doing the storytelling better than you do, Mike, let us know. Oh, yeah. I forgot to bring that up. I think you did. I think you did a fantastic I job. I think I did all right. I kind of messed up a little bit. But we all do. We all, yeah. I do, too. I know. I say two mortar mur- murons. Yeah. And that makes absolutely zero sense. And the thing that I was really surprised about is that, you know, you typed this up for me to make it look better than the format that I had it in. And uh, you actually didn't have any misspellings. I was actually shocked. I tried. Yeah. I tried really hard. No, but I really think I think you did a good job. So comment if you watch our show and have seen other episodes, you know, do you like, should we start bouncing back and forth? Yeah. We're like, I host one, Mike hosts one. Yeah, what do you like? What Let do you us like better? comment on it. Let us know what you think. And, yeah. you know, we read those, we respond to we'll them. We'll be and, upset by it. If you say you like him better than me, that's fine. I'll go well, with that. Yeah. I like being well, the other guy too. Well, with my hat on, my man. eyes all dark. I do have to admit, that being the hype man is kind of cool because I it feel is. like I didn't have to do much. Yeah. <laughs> like I just showed up today. Yeah, you just kind of like, wait, kind of wait where to plug in stuff. It's like, where, uh, what are we doing today, Mike? Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah I uh, actually had fun with this. Yeah, it was a good time. Well, I'm sure we'll do this again. Oh yeah, we should probably bounce back a little bit. I think so. To give a different flavor. Different flavor. Yeah. Also, we want to give credit where credit is due. Correct. Obviously, this is a true story, and yep. we did not write the no, story. No, we did it's not. a real life thing. Um, we used Wikipedia for most of our research. Yep. So if you want to learn more about Miss Puente, um, the link to that article that we used to research this episode is in the description. Yep. So check it out. Check it out. All right. We've got another crazy, kooky, and insane story for you next week. So be sure you turn in. T- oh, my God. Turn in. Turn in. Turn it in. Turn, turn it in. Turn, turn in. it up. Turn it over. We're trying to be, you know, trying to get the kids trying to, to be watch, hit. too. Trying to be hit. Trying to be hit. Get those teenagers get those uh, young kids on oh my god anyway what i'm trying to say is tune in next wednesday yeah for for another story and we will uh we'll see you then thanks for tuning in yep thanks for coming